Clyde Berry, a known artifact collector at the time. Uh, he collected a total of 42 pre-contact artifacts and designated a series of uh, collection areas, um, areas A through E on the map there, um, along high terraces overlooking the Emmistake Falls. In 2021, Victoria Bunker Inc. Um, or VBI identified additional components of the site that archeologists uh, determined roughly corresponds with area C in the middle there. Um, PBI collected a total of 775 pre-contact artifacts, uh, but was unable to determine the horizontal limits of the site um, due to the constraints of the project that they were working on. Um, in 2022, IAC was uh, returned to that area uh, to test around the same uh, site as PBI. Um, and conducted a phase 1B and targeted data recovery, uh, collecting a total of 1,019 pre-contact artifacts, the majority of which were uncovered within the limits of a pit house feature. Um, the complete MSCAG West Bank site uh, limits have not been conclusively uh, determined due to the limited and very segmented um, nature of the previous testing, and it likely extends well past our current excavation limits. Um, according to Barry's notes, the site extends approximately 2,000 feet west from the Merrimack River um, and between 500 and 1,000 feet to the north and south. Um, it is documented as sitting on a high terrace opposite the Smith and Neville sites and north of the Eddy site. Very approximated that uh, Emma Skag West Bank site um, is likely dates back to around 8,000 uh, BP before present um, due to its proximity to the Smith, Neville, and Eddy sites. Um, and uh, that date was preliminarily confirmed by VBI and IAC through our artifact assemblages um, and uh, two radiocarbon dates. IAC was also able to note a preliminary Paleo-Indian component, which uh, Jake will discuss in more detail a bit later. Uh, Barry himself collected an assortment of stone tools, including uh, stem point fragments. Um, he also noted a presence of red ochre and a human cremation burial assemblage that is documented as being repatriated. BBI collected uh, four bifacial tools, as well as an assortment of groundstone tools, uh, cores, scrapers, debitage, along with 205 pre-contact ceramic shirts, with, uh, which contain a minimum of nine pre-contact uh, vessels. Um, the current site limits are surrounded by a large amount of disturbance in the form of modern uh, development, particularly of housing and roads. Um, however, the site itself within our excavation limits had excellent archeological integrity and distinct cultural deposits within the different um, soil strata. During IAC's limited phase 1B, we were restricted to excavating only the direct impacts to structures 66 <coughs> and 68, which included um, the work pads around the structures as well as access roads to and from the structures. Uh, we excavated 37 test holes, 19 at structure 68, 18 at structure 66, and collected a total of 53 pre-contact artifacts, including a large assemblage of debitage, as well as one core and one prismatic quartz blade photographed in the top center of this slide, just uh, here. Um, our targeted data recovery <laughs> was focused around the base of structure 66, um, as the majority of this disturbance would occur there. And um, it was all around this structure that we collected the highest density of pre-contact artifacts during our phase 1B. Our excavations were limited to two three meter square blocks um, to encompass the two new pole bases at structure 66 and two one meter by one meter uh, units at the locations for two guy wires around structure 68. Um, we utilized a total station for our horizontal precision and a laser level for our uh, site datum and vertical distribution uh, accuracy. Um, over the course of nine days, IAC collected a total of 966 pre-contact artifacts from the targeted data recovery excavation alone, including 859 uh, debitage, 38 pre-contact ceramic shards, and 69 other artifact types, which included calcine bone, lithic tools, and um, shell. 
the excavation blocks were separated into a northern block and a southern block. Um, the northern block had more evidence of post-contact disturbance, likely due to pole maintenance, as a grounding wire uh, was exposed running across the center of it. You can see that in those photos there, but just behind uh, Jake. <laughs> um, the southern block, however, had much less evidence for post-contact disturbance, and it's within this southern unit that we uncovered the um, what we think is the entrance of the pit house feature. Uh, the overall artifact assemblage is comprised mainly of lithic debitage from multiple uh, raw material sources, including quartz, rhyolite, chert, and hornfells. Um, the ceramic shards range from the early woodland or CP1 period to the late woodland or CP6 period um, based on their superficial decorations. Um, some of the tool types collected include abraders, scrapers, five piece fragments, um, stone hoe, hammer stone, um, as well as a few projectile points that we were able to associate with the squid knocket stemmed uh, Merrimack and Stark types. And now Jake will take over and go into more detail about what we collected and the pit house itself. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I talked a little loud, so it was too loud, I just waved around. Um, I'm going to start with just a little rundown of the artifacts again. We collected 909 uh, debitage specimens, and you can see the distribution by type and the table and the pie chart along with some photo examples of the raw materials. What stood out to me, there are only 99 primary flakes, or about 11% of the total, which suggests that that initial reduction took place at another location, whether closer to the stone source or maybe at another portion of the site. Uh, but then again, we also do have 15 biface thin flakes and 52 pressure flakes. So there is some late stage work and edge maintenance happening at the location. And finally, 42% shatter, shatter, a big function of that is we had a lot of quartz, which of course, as many of you know, is prone to making that those blocky shatter debitage. We also collected 30 tools and you can see the distribution by type in the pie chart in the table there. Of particular note, Oh, there up here are the three point bases. And as Shannon mentioned, we identified a Merrimack type from the middle archaic, a Stark type also from the middle archaic, and a Splignocket stem type uh, from the transitional archaic. Uh, in addition, what caught my eye are these three blades here. Now, formal blades are generally defined by a series of criteria that include at least a two to one length to width ratio, triangular prismatic or trapezoidal cross sections, roughly parallel lateral edges with no ed evidence that they were shaped that way, they just fractured that way, and parallel longitudinal dorsal flake scars, so parallel flake scars on the back side of the blades. And even the, in those photos, you can kind of see those attributes. Um, formal blade technology in North America is most commonly associated with the Clovis techno complex. Um, and of course, other people have made blades throughout time, but I found it interesting that we had that quantity of formal blades just within our excavation blocks. We also found uh, the ultra thin biface, that red specimen there. Um, An ultra thin is classified as having between a seven to one and 13 to one width to thickness ratio. Our specimen was at nine to one. So it's definitely within that range. And again, that ultra thin technology is most commonly associated with the Paleo Indian techno complex. Uh, also really cool, this uh, peck stone slab, which we kind of tentatively identified as a stone hoe. You can see the size of it here, and you can see some step fractures along the end as evidence of use wear. So it could have been used to process material or just for digging purposes. Uh, we did also collect 38 pre-contact ceramics, which we have tentatively placed in these six very preliminary vessel lots. Uh, it includes uh, two lots of early woodland vanette one pottery from ceramic period one, uh, a body shirt with that fabric paddle, but then highly smooth, which is typically a little later in the ceramic period, so you couldn't really get more than that, but somewhere between CP2 and CP6. We have a uh, dentate stamp shirt for lot four, a, those three refitting shirts, lot five here, which had both dentate stamp and cord wrap stick, and then finally, another single shirt with a slightly different pattern of cord wrap stick. And those three later lots we have tentatively placed in CP4 in the middle woodland period. This is just kind of a summary of those 38 shirts to give you an idea of the, attribute, the attributes that we record. Um, 
it's kind of cut off on the end, but you can see a lot of not applicable in the vessel lock column. And those are shirts that are too small to really be useful in that analysis. We also identified 35, 34 loci. We use the term locus or plural loci in the field so that we can number phenomena that we observe in the soil without having to make an immediate determination as to whether it's a cultural feature or a natural anomaly. And so it allows us to have the time to really look at these before we designate them as such. So we identified 34 loci. That map shows everything in the Southern block, which by far had the higher concentration. Of those, we have 12 pre-contact loci, including four hearths four in situ artifact deposits, and most exciting of all, a pit house. We also identified six post-contact loci, all of which seem pretty clearly associated with the either existing or former electrical transmission structures in the right of way. And then we also identified 16, what we have designated as soil anomalies. This includes rodent burrows, root runs, um, as well as phenomena that had some attributes of pre-contact or post-contact cultural features, but didn't have really sufficient evidence to definitively identify them as such. So we're not saying they're not, but we just don't have enough to, you know, to call them that at this time. Uh, so again, the coolest thing, the pit house. Um, so that image in the upper left is the southern wall of our southern excavation block. So that's the limit of our, of, as far as we got into the pit house. The map shows the southern wall on the bottom and the various shades of red from dark to light, the darkest being the uppermost level of which we documented it, the, bottom, the lighter pink being the base. Um, we believe that that kind of tunnel or the bird neck, if you will, it's probably the doorway or the entrance way to the pit house. Um, that image in the bottom left is from a relatively recent thesis on semi-subterranean structures in Northern New England, primarily in Connecticut, Massachusetts. And this is an artist's representation of how those structures were built, how they looked and how they were used. In this case, he postulates as a uh, sweat lodge or sweat house of some kind. And what's really cool is just looking at this image in relation to, to our pit house, you can see a very similar shape in its profile. This hearth at the bottom was Locust 34. And it was the deepest point of our excavations at 260 centimeters below datum or 55 inches. So about OSHA maximum depth that we could get to. Um, and we actually had charcoal from that dated and it came back at 5,130 BP. So we've really confidently uh, identified a date for this feature. And it was really hard to identify. You can see uh, right below the A horizon is a really well-developed B horizon. And so we didn't quite know what we were dealing with until we got to the top of the lower BC horizon, which was much paler and you could really see those features stand out. And uh, just to go back, it encompassed a whole suite of sub-features, post holes, hearths, pits, and that kind of gives you an, an idea of the, the density within the 17 itself. Um, now a little bit about the general horizontal distribution. As Shannon mentioned, we also tested at structure 66 with very different results. We identified a small quartz activity locus, but that was about it. We didn't collect a lot of material. We found one feature that had been pretty heavily disturbed by agricultural land use. So I'm gonna focus more on structure 66, which is that detail map here. Um, the small squares are our phase 1B shovel test pits, and then the larger squares are the test units that comprise our targeted data recovery blocks. What's really interesting to me is that the blue numbers are the quantity of pre-contact artifacts in each of those STPs. We've got one, one, two, one, eight, you know, 22 down near the trail, but nothing to indicate the density of material that we were going to find. I sure didn't expect it when we started opening up those blocks. And to me, it's just kind of a, a testament for how, you know, we really need those phase two targeted data recovery, those larger block excavations to make any determination about a site's significance or eligibility for the National Register. Uh, these are details of the two blocks, the northern block on the left, which was only less than two meters from the southern block. There's the southern block with, again, the limits of the Locus 17 pit house. What is immediately apparent, the southern block had almost twice as many pre-contact artifacts, uh, only a third of the post-contact artifacts, and that is obviously extremely interesting. Uh, one theory that it may be that, again, the primary domestic activities and in, in, activity episodes occurred in and near the pit house itself, which would make sense. And perhaps that Northern block was either just not utilized as intensively or maybe 
intentionally kept clear as an activity area or you know some kind of uh, clean space outside the structure itself. It could also be the northern block encompass the vast majority of the post contact disturbance and features. So it could also be that the artifact the discrepancy between artifact distribution is the function of those features that have we found fill within them that didn't necessarily look like local soil. So there's a good chance some of that material got scooped out and taken away uh, during those events. Uh, a little bit about the raw material distribution. Uh, you can see here broken down by uh, raw material and table in pie chart form uh, with some photo examples. Obviously what stands out right away, 45% of the overall distribution is quartz, 28% is rhyolite, and 13% is hornfels, which are all fairly common materials here in New Hampshire. We had some uh, smaller examples of just two chert, three jasper, 14 felsite. And again, this is kind of a, a typical distribution for a lot of sites that, that I've worked on uh, in the Merrimack Valley. What's really interesting, there's an, a picture of it here, and then another picture here. We found these large chunks of what looks to be rhyolite, but it was patinated, often eroded, um, angular, and it was difficult to identify at first as cultural. One of the main reasons we could is because like, sounds like, like Bear Brook, there was almost no naturally occurring stone in the soil. So these objects obviously stood out. And then I, we looked back um, at the VBI report and Vicky also identified this blocky coarse rhyolite at the lower excavation level. So there's something, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting and I'm excited to see, you know, do some further analysis and, and see what we come up with from that. The vertical distribution, even by just soil horizon, it is really cool as well. So quartz makes up, um, over 60% of the lithic material in the A and B horizons, 30% in the BC, that's so a sharp drop. Um, in contrast, rhyolite forms 45% of the, art of the lithic material in the BC horizon, which we believe to encompass the, the oldest occupation levels. And so even at, and then less than 20% in the overlying A and B horizon. So even at this very kind of broad vertical distribution, I think we're looking at distinct, temporally distinct cultural deposits with distinct methods of raw material use. The tool provenience also kind of uh, indicates those distinct deposits. So we've got the blades on the left there, two of which were in the BC horizon, one of which was in the lower levels of the B. And then we have the points, the uh, squid knocket stemmed in the Merrimack were both in strat one level two, so kind of midway down that surface A horizon. And then the start point was in the uppermost level of the underlying B horizon. And again, there's that ultra thin biface. And with that profile shot, you can see how amazingly thin that is. You can see the shape of the original flake and the work to further reduce it. It also looks to me like we may have a potential ear formed in this corner and that you can see the taper here. And I'm wondering if you know some kind of maybe a fluting attempt or some kind of basal thinning is the fracture that took this chunk out and kind of killed the piece, quote unquote. Uh, the ceramic distribution, this just kind of shows there is some mixing in the sense that we had early woodland sherds above middle woodland sherds, but again, they're almost all um, in the uppermost levels of soil, which we did was clearly disturbed by likely agriculture. We found a couple of plow scars and definitely by construction, the use of the electrical transmission corridor. But what, what's cool is that even with that, um, that disturbance, all of those ceramics are generally between uh, 130 and 160 centimeters below datum. So really, you know, 20, 30 centimeters is not a huge vertical uh, distance. And so again, we're looking, I think, clearly at a woodland component overlying uh, earlier occupations. So just to kind of summarize, um, the Amoskeg West Bank site is a large site with unknown limits. Now, between our testing at these, our, and Vicky's testing at these structures, we've got pretty good east-west limits uh, that extend across about you know, almost 750 feet. And it's very likely that the construction of Coolidge Ave and the other features on the east end of the site truncated that, that portion of it. Um, but we had negative test holes west of our structure 66, which is at the western limits of our excavations. Vicky also had negative test holes in that area, so we, there's a good chance we've at, at least identified a western boundary. Um, but as far as north and south, we just don't know. We may never know uh, because of the, de the degree of development. What's also interesting is the Mercier site is documented almost directly south 
of where structure 66 is. And I believe it was um, in someone's garden. But so, so, it, um, so we may be looking rather that two distinct sites, the Mercier site and the MS State West Bank site might just be one large occupation. Um, we have high archeological integrity with temporally distinct cultural deposits and that's despite its location in one of the most developed parts of the state. Um, so it's really an amazing and rare resource. We have uh, occupation from the middle archaic to the middle woodland period. So we're looking at you know, 7,000 years of history. Oh, I should mention we also, uh, Locust 29 was a hearth feature that extended down from the base of the A horizon. We also submitted charcoal from that for dating and came back with the date of 1,200 BP. So we have charcoal dates from the, uh, you know, from the archaic through the woodland periods to support the diagnostic artifact data. Uh, and again, we've got intact and formative deposits that include a really regionally rare feature in the, in the form of a pit house. And, and we, were, I, I, we were so lucky, it was just chance that we happened to intersect that feature with our targeted data recovery block because in that situation, they just tell us, hey, this is where we're putting our poles. Dig, you know, so we dig to encompass any disturbance associated with that. And just coincidentally, that Southern block happened to clip the Northern edge of the pit house. So that is still there. The rest of it's still there. Who knows how, how far it is, but it's intact. It's protected by almost five feet of soil. So we've got an amazing resource right here in this town that is just can offer so much more information. So additional research questions. We may, um, obviously, like I said, site boundaries. We really don't know how far uh, this resource extends. Um, it, it's again, we've got some data for east west, but as far as north south, we just don't know. And we again may never know because of the degree of development and private, you know, private property and, and everything else. But that's obviously a real big important question. Also, seasonality. You know, when I first started thinking about it, the construction of a semi-subterranean structure like that is pretty labor intensive. So I thought, okay, maybe this is a, a winter occupation because it's going to keep you warm, help protect you against those elements. Then again, a semi-subterranean structure can also keep it cool in the summer months. So we really don't, don't know, and we didn't find enough to answer that question. And that also leads to the next one, is the type of land use. Is it a residential structure, an occupation, or is it something else? We didn't find a lot of food waste or domestic, or, you know, we only had 13 calcined bone specimens. So it's really unclear as to, is this an occupation someplace where people lived and slept, or was it as implied by that illustration, uh, something, something more uh, less residential, more ceremonial. And of course, again, we just barely clipped it. So it's difficult. Those are questions we can't answer at this time. But based on the fact that that feature keeps going under the ground, I think those, those answers are there. And then again, we've got 7,000 years of history. And I, I feel uh, pretty strongly based on the ultra thin and the blades that we've, and that patinated rhyolite that there's, there's a strong potential for a paleo Indian component. And hopefully additional excavation, uh, more research could answer those questions as well. And that's it, any questions? Yes. Just, just a clarification for myself, did you completely excavate the pit No, the way these, um, with the targeted data recovery, the our client tells gives us the location of their new poles, and then we dig uh, blocks to completely encompass any disturbance that could occur within that area. So, I mean, it's it's frustrating. It, it's bad and good all at the same time because on one hand, <laughs> exactly, we kind of clip the uh, just the edge. There, so it seems to extend south, east, and west beyond the limits of the, of the block. So, you, unfortunately, we couldn't excavate the whole thing. But on the plus side, it's still there, and it's in the ground. And maybe someday, hopefully, hopefully us, but hopefully someone will go back and, and be able to do some more work. Yes. I may have missed it, but based on what you found, what side did you say that You know, it, we've kind of extrapolated it, and uh, I would say it's got to go at least another two to three meters south. I think we're getting close by the curvature. I think we're getting fairly close to the eastern and western edges. So, I mean, I'd be willing to bet it's, you know, three to four meters minimum across completely. Hunter? Um, I don't know if you had a chance to do like, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Smith Eddie Neville sites. Um, and I can't remember the specifics of what those sites speak to um, all archaic, but. Uh, did you have a chance to compare similarities and differences? And is there a chance it could have been, you know, simultaneously occupied 
<laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm actually still writing this report right now, so I haven't got to that point yet, but I am going to look at those sites in more detail because we've as we've got, everyone is familiar with the Merrimack knows there's just a sweep of sites up and down the river, and a lot of them do seem to be roughly contemporaneous, especially when you've got multi-component sites like this. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what size are you using? Uh, we used... Uh, quarter inch for the general soil, an eighth inch for anything that had that or if we got into one of those in situ artifact deposits or anything, any locus that we thought was a feature or a potential feature. We also took a ton of soil samples and took them back to the lab for even like one millimeter, two millimeter screen uh, screening and flotation. Yes, sir. Um, so you a multi-component site, you've got a variety of diagnostics, you have a, a dated feature. What are the relationships of those stated things to the dead house? So, yeah, so um, Locust 34 was the, the deepest point of the pit house. It was a hearth down at that deepest little divot in the base. And that was the one that dated to 5,130. Um, Locust 29 isn't on this map. It, it was right about here. And it was, um, although it overlaps with that portion of the pit house, the feature extended down from the A horizon. So it had a good, vertical space between the two features. And that was the one that dated to 1200 BP. Are there any ceramics directly associated with the big house? Um, no, I don't believe so. I think there, there may have been one, uh, but it was also near a, a, a locus that we were pretty confident is a rodent burrow. Um, but yeah, I, 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 that's another thing I'm gonna look into in more detail is seeing, but the, the pit house itself did produce the vast majority of the artifacts. But the ceramics seem to come from, uh, I believe actually most of them came from the Northern Block. Yes, ma'am? Um, Gary Marshall, a number of the Berwick Jackson's in Manchester. But here, what we have is the storage of the store. They really hammered West Bank. Now, did you encounter any signs of where the storage is? We did have a couple of features that looked strangely like shovel test pits. And um, um, and then we weren't sure if maybe they were old square transmission structures because they were really deep, like deeper than someone could get with a shovel. But we did run into a couple of things that looked like they may have been older pits. Okay. Thank you. Okay.